Invest in things you know and love. I keep my office pretty cold. So it's 61 degrees on my uh, thermostat. And when you're more alert, you make better decisions. The road to a wealthy retirement is paved with several key decisions. What stocks to buy or what assets to buy is number one. That's probably what gets 98% of the airtime and, and mental energy of most investors. But there's asset allocation, there's asset location, the whole business of having a plan. And my guest today this is a special interview because we're going to talk about both of those. We usually focus just on the stocks, but today we're going to focus on both. And my guest is my friend Austin Root. He has a fantastic pedigree as far as hedge fund backgrounds go. He worked at Blackstone. SAC Capital, that's Stephen Cohen's fund. He has a Stanford MBA and he ran a hedge fund with investment from Julian Robertson of Tiger Management. So Austin, welcome. Thank you so much, James. It's a pleasure to, to be on your show and to, to see you again. So you are Chief Investment Officer of Stansbury Asset Management. Uh, Sam, we're going to say for short, uh, you that's have right. a great background, as I just mentioned before. Sam has about a billion dollars under management and it tends to run money for wealthier individuals, but the principles and the ideas and the stocks we're going to talk about today, they really apply to anyone, whether you got $10,000 to invest or, or $10 million to invest. That's right. Yeah. In fact, we are trying to provide that institutional grade uh, investment process and opportunities to, um, to, to individual investors. Our, our investors tend to be on the wealthier side, but you know, we generally love if they come with their entire family. So we have we have starter accounts at uh, twenty thousand. Great, great. So before we get into details, a quick lightning round is what I like to do these days. Uh, don't think too much; these are low stress questions. Jerome Powell, closer to zero or hero? I think he's closer to hero. Um, certainly made some some bad choices in terms of. Um, being a little slow, uh, you know, but there are a lot of there are a lot of moving parts in the economy, and I think it's I think most people um, would be surprised at how well the economy is performing. The employment uh, picture is is holding in there in the face of one of the fastest rate hikes uh, ever. Yeah, and for what what it's worth, I agree with you. I mean, yeah, he messed up initially. We got way too much inflation, but I mean, for a guy in kind of a can't win spot because everybody likes to feed up on on the Fed, I that's think right. he's, he's done pretty darn well. Um, probably a lot that's better right. than I would do in his shoes. Yeah, um, I mean, that's right. Play the way he played the hand he was dealt pretty well. Is it a great hand? Do we love the Fed? I mean, we, those are sub debates for another time. Exactly. Uh, single sentence or so investing advice you would give to your kids. Uh, invest in things you know and love. Number of days in a week that you don't wear a vest. Ha. <laughs> um, you know, probably two or three. It's not that. It's not. <laughs> You've always got I, one on whenever we talk. I just had to ask. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep my office. Um, so Steve Cohen did this uh, as well. I keep my office pretty cold. So it's sixty-one degrees on my. Uh, wow. thermostat. And then also I like to golf with a vest on the weekend. So there's, there aren't that many, I guess in the <laughs> summer, it'd be fewer days. Just when you're in the shower and the, the swimming or right. something. Yeah. Right. And, and Steve right. did that because there's some study that shows you, you, when you're a little bit on edge because of the cold, you perform a little bit better. Stay, you're, you're more alert. And when you're more alert, you make better decisions. Yep. Interesting. So you, 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 you carry that with you. That habit. Very interesting. Carry that with me. Also, it's probably that I'm just a cheapskate. I, I, uh, <laughs> my, uh, you know, I pay the, pay the bills for the office. And so I don't want to overly heat it up. Now I hear you. we do have our New York office. Um, we have our, 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 our controller prefers it warmer. So he actually wears a vest seven days a week. And it's a heated electrical vest. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's intense. Because yeah. we keep it not warm enough for him, apparently. Got it. But apparently warmer than 61. Uh, right. So so let's go back to what we were talking about earlier. This idea that, and, and people know these concepts, but I think I'd like to disambiguate a little bit, be a little more precise, strategic and tactical. Like, what, what do these words mean? I mean, there, there's asset allocation. There, there's picking stocks. Like, can, can you can you break it down a little bit more precisely, basically? Yeah, absolutely, um, James. We we talked about this uh, off air before we hopped on, uh, hopped on, but I, this market 
is tricky. Obviously, that we're we're pushing higher in in certain parts of the of the market, but you and I and most investors can also sense that there are reasons to be cautious, um, potentially even bearish for other parts of the market, perhaps the market overall at some point. So for this market in particular, we're really telling clients that you need to be both strategic and tactical. Um, I think too, too few investors are both. They tend to be one or the other. And so what do I mean by that? Um, I think both are important, by the way, James, in, in my view. Um, strategic in, in our eyes at SAM, it starts with knowing your investment goals. We, we believe that every investor has just kind of three goals, some combination of three goals, uh, capital appreciation or getting wealthy or more wealthy, capital preservation or staying wealthy, making sure you keep what you have, and then generating sturdy current income uh, or getting paid. Uh, and, and so you know, we work with clients to understand what the combination of, of their goals are for that and build a portfolio of assets that are attractive on a risk adjusted basis that can get them to that long term goal. So that's really the strategic part of it. I think people need to, to do that more often. There's so many folks um, that identify good investments. Um, on an individual basis and kind of just throw them together and, and hope that the goulash tastes good when you just keep throwing um, ingredients together. But as you know, sometimes, particularly over the long term, that approach is not, is not perfect. And so we, we like to introduce not just the right mix, but also um, portfolio management tools, like making sure we're, our, our, our um, no one security is too large. Um, so, so, uh, asset allocation and portfolio and position sizing, as well as risk management tools, um, so that no one risk factor is too high. That's the strategic part. Um, sorry, the, the the tactical part I think is is also equally important, particularly in this market, and and that is first and foremost that is investing is seasonal. You can't. Um, it, there are times when it's better to be invested in certain asset classes than others. When interest rates are going up, when default rates are potentially going up, that is a terrible time to be invested in long-term high-yield bonds, for example. And in fact, going into 2022, we didn't own a single bond for any one of our clients. Hmm. But, but think about the flip side. If interest rates are coming down, and therefore the value of your bonds are going up, um, and, and default rates are going from high, from bad to less bad, Golly, that's an incredible time to own high yield bonds, for example. So you got to know that investing is seasonal and you want and to be tactical, you want to put your um, assets in what you think are the right places on a risk adjusted basis to generate great returns. The second piece of being tactical, though, is then you need to be nimble. You won't always be right and the world will change. So there, set it and forget it is really not the way it may have worked for the infomercials, but it will not work for your portfolio because the market is a ch ever changing place. And, and we want to be tactical and make sure we're, we're changing with it. And just to add some color on that, if somebody's kind of new to investing, not being in bonds in 2022 was pretty, I mean, this was a year in which long-term treasuries went down 40%. That's like a once in a lifetime thing. That's it basically never happens because they're they're risk free in a credit risk sense, but obviously not in a price risk in terms of interest rate risk. So so being out of bonds in 2022 was was an incredibly smart move. Uh, and, and you're basically talking about the fusion of multiple different things, uh, sort of a multi-planar approach. I'm, I'm I'm searching for the right word. Uh, well, one thing we talked about before the recording was, you know, I'm a plant buff. I'm in the American conifer society. So I think in plant terms, and I mentioned a garden center analogy, like a lot of people do it wrong. They go to the garden centers. Oh, this looks cute. This looks cool. I'll buy this. I'll buy this. And, and individually, they look great. But you come home and you just stick them in the ground. It looks ugly. Like you need a plan. And, and you, you kind of one up me and said, well, th there's even seasonality to it. You wouldn't go buy, you know, annual flowers in the middle of winter, for example, right? It's the wrong time. Uh, so you're, there, there's there's the plan, there's the, the which assets do you want to put in the plan, then there's the timing of which assets for what time and for how long. Is that is that is that the right way to frame it? I 
I think that's a great analogy, James. I, I'm glad you came up with it. I, I've talked about it being, you know, building a ha- building your dream house. Um, but I think that the seasonal part of 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 building your dream house's backyard uh, flora and fauna uh, scape is probably the best way to to think about the analogy. And so what do you think is, you know, if someone's new, relatively new to investing, watching this saying, OK, you know, I, I've been kind of just picking and choosing. And I, I see some technical analysis guys advice. And then sometimes I see someone else who's more of a value. And I got some mutual funds in my 401k. Like it's kind of like kind of a mix. And they never really like sat down and thought strategically if they don't have access to Sam or to you. Like what are some basic guidelines just in, in a nutshell that someone could use? Yeah, I think that's it's a it's a great question. Yeah, certainly you don't have to use a financial advisor to do this. Um, I will tell you that um, there are some benefits that we can talk about that in a second. But I, th- I think a first uh, understanding of what you're trying to do is um, at the core of anyone's portfolio is owning great businesses. I I, I think we we start there, which even if your goal is to generate income, well, buy the great businesses that have a nice dividend. Um, what we, when we talk about great businesses, we're talking about ones that um, have attractive um, margin profile. So they, they, they actually make money selling or doing whatever they do. Um, they have nice return on invested capital. So they can just grow by virtue of investing in their own core business. Um, Buffett or Munger or or many other folks would talk about having a a durable franchise, one that you can see being a you know a existing business ten years or more in the future. So it's not it's not so uh, a competitive or um, a fad. And so you put all those things together. And by the way, we like it when businesses have good balance sheets um, are run by um, uh, managers that are not only good in terms of visionary, but are great capital allocators. You'd be surprised how important capital allocation is to the overall returns of a stock. So we want uh, managers that are good, ethical, smart capital allocators with skin in the game. You put all that together and you can find businesses that you think will be bigger, better, more profitable franchises a decade from now than they are today. And you own them for the long term, and those will generate, you know, truly transformational wealth over the long term. I, I certainly can't argue with that. I mean, it's worked for Buffett. Uh, it, it's good for society too, uh, for those who care about that. In other words, if you're kind of discriminating between good and bad companies, you're, you're depriving the bad companies of capital, and you're giving it to the good companies. That's good. Whereas if I'm just trading on some, you know, blips on on my, you know, high frequency trading screen. I'm basically just injecting volatility into the system. Yes, some liquidity also, which is beneficial, but like I'm not really helping the world get any better. But when I really try to find those good long-term companies, I am doing that. So, so it is a good, healthy thing. Uh, so that obviously applies to equities. In terms of Sam, uh, fixed income or or whatever else, like is equities your main thing? Like, what other thinking do you do for different asset classes? Yeah. So um, we we love fixed income. At a high level, it it can serve in many cases as a ballast for your portfolio. You mentioned in 2022, it did not. In fact, it it hurt folks and and our clients benefited from us sitting in cash at a period. You know, we had some clients ask, why why are we doing this? They always ask, why are you in cash? Yeah. yeah. Then then they saw how poorly uh, fixed income uh, performed in that in that way. We have. three buckets of credit. So just broadly speaking, credit for our clients right now. One is um, short-term U.S. treasuries. Mm -hmm. You know, you're generating five plus percent for what is as close to risk-free as possible. So we think of that as our dry powder. Um, Mm -hmm. There are things to be worried about in the world, and we'd like to have some dry powder so that if markets sell off and folks are are forced to um, sell world-class businesses and assets at fire sale prices. We want to have some dry powder to be able to do that. Yep. And we can, we can generate 5% return um, at, in the meantime. Um, we don't own a lot of sort of 
grade A investment grade bonds, um, those are just trading at such a tight spread to treasuries, um, meaning that you're not getting much more return for the, the incremental level of risk you're taking. Um, but within the corporate bond market, we do own um, what we call busted converts. So mm -hmm. these are convertible bonds issued by a company at a very low interest rate, but with the idea that they could convert into equity if the stock price keeps appreciating. Um, many smart CFOs, when interest rates were low in 21, in 2021, issued a number of these. Unfortunately, their stock has gone down, not up. And so the, the converts are, quote, busted because they will almost virtually never be able to convert um, into never equity stock, because the equity yeah. prices are so low. These are kind of orphan securities and we can find and, you know, because we spend a, ton, a lot of time doing it, um, securities that are investment grade, but trade at a much higher spread to a typical investment grade uh, credit because of this busted nature of them. And so we own a number of those and we're excited about those. And um, they may pay us very little interest in the near term, but if we're buying them at 60, 70, 80 cents on the dollar, um, then just as they move from 70 to 100, we're, we're generating uh, profit profits. The last piece, sorry to go along in the answer, is for a number of our clients, we are invested in private credit. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we started a private credit fund um, and that opportunity is really fantastic right now for um, direct lending to those companies um, that have great businesses, but are just a little bit different and um, therefore can't um, don't traditionally fit in, in the bank lending model. So banks love to invest to lend against assets. They, they love to lend to people that don't need the money, James. Exactly. Um, yeah. and, and as banks have pulled back, have they, as they've reduced risk, there are some world-class businesses um, that aren't getting the lending, but direct lenders within private credit, you can generate um, great loans. I'll give you an example, uh, SaaS businesses. So software mm -hmm. as a service businesses have excellent recurring revenues, but they don't have many hard assets. So we have partnered with uh, an opera, a SaaS uh, entrepreneur turned SaaS lender who understands this business. And that's an example of something where you can generate near equity or equity return like returns with far less risk. You're senior secured in the capital structure. So those are the three parts of fixed income we're, we're doing with our clients. And the private credit, these are companies that, like you mentioned, maybe aren't a fit for bank financing for a different, maybe not stable enough, but they're not maybe big enough to do like a bond issuance on the capital markets. So they're kind of in this weird in-between zone and, yeah. and the returns are a little bit more. I mean, the fees can be high, too, in some cases for some of these funds, but, you know, the 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 return profile can be attractive to to the investor. Super attractive. And, and in, in the case of the SaaS example, th those are actually more stable than your average company. They have a recurring revenue of 90% plus. It's just that there's no hard assets for yeah. a traditional bank to lend against. Excellent. Uh, briefly, uh, gold and Bitcoin are two things that people love to talk about. They're, they're, they're assets, but they're also almost religions in and of themselves. Uh, what's your take on each? Yeah, so um, we think that both have a place in most clients' uh, investment portfolios. We and for our clients, we own both gold and Bitcoin. Um, I will say, I will say a big caveat though. I think of those as stores of value. Mm -hmm. We think we at Sam think of those as stores of value. They are superior stores of value than fiat currencies. And as your dollar is being debased by three percent plus a year, um, gold and Bitcoin certainly are not being. Um, debased by that level. So over the long term, they will far outpace the value of, of the a dollar. Quick ex uh, um, example I give, James, is you know, you're know you a well-dressed guy. If you had bought a suit at Saks Fifth Avenue 100 years ago, it would have cost you about 20 bucks or an ounce of gold. If you bought it today, $2,000 or about an ounce of gold. So which of those was a better store of value? Um, the same is true for Bitcoin. I think there's a high demand for Bitcoin. So I could see the, and it's certainly more volatile, but 
over the very long term, we prefer productive assets, those assets that can generate a return for their owners in excess of the cost of capital, in excess of inflation. Um, and, and so we really, while we, we like those as stores of value, they're a smaller part of our clients' portfolios with far more, uh, far much uh, rather own either those private credit assets or some world-class um, forever businesses that you think will be bigger, better uh, a decade from now. It totally makes sense to me. I mean, gold, to be fair, since 2000, I believe, has outpaced the S&P 500, but it is very easy to commit chart crime with gold, you know, and, and pick and choose. In general, it's not an earning asset. And I guess same thing for Bitcoin. Uh, and it would make sense if Bitcoin was, right? They're, they're not designed to be that. Uh, Austin, let's shift gears a little bit in terms of what we're looking at, or uh, what you're looking at, in, in terms of the, the, the tactical part. Uh, broadly speaking, we've had a very interesting market for the past 15 years, 14 years, mostly up. Obviously, not not up in 2022, but now back to going up. We've had uh, last year 24 percent of the stocks in the S&P 500 underperform only only 24 percent, I should say, outperform the index. That means more right. than 75 percent did not. So you have a small number of rowers in the boat, like you know, basically contributing to, to most of the momentum. Uh, how do you feel about the market broadly? And then, are there some sectors that you like and, and don't like as much? Yeah, no, it's it's a great point, James. The you know, there's been many years when you talk about the market, you can you can make comments, and it, and it's true for most of the stocks in the market. The last um, eighteen months, twenty four months, that that hasn't been true at all. Um, a large cap growth tech investment is so much more different in terms of its return profile over the last eighteen months than small cap value industrial or pick pick your industry in sector that is in tech. And so um, that's been true even this year. You know, it, it mm -hmm. felt like at the end of 2023, there was going to be a broadening out and the S&P 500 equal weight and the Russell 2000, which is smaller companies, um, outperform for a small bit. That hasn't been the case. It's kind of we've reverted back the, for the first part of, of the year here in 2024. Um, so we're, but we're seeing opportunities in both. Actually, we there are some um, world class, larger cap growth companies that we like. So it's not it's not that we're saying we're saying avoid those um, full scale. We are underweight that Mag Seven that is maybe Mag Five now. We are underweight those for the next layer of world class uh, growth businesses. We also like small caps quite a bit and. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some, there are also some, I, I would say probably our favorite, our median investment is actually a mid cap, a, mm -hmm. a five to 10 to $15 billion market cap company that has the scale to be able to, to grow and, and expand and, and generate strong returns, but also is earlier in their life cycle. And, and we as investors can, can enjoy, um, enjoy some of the growth with them. If you look, James, over the last 30 years, the best performing stocks, um, they're from all different industries. There's only one thing they have in common. They were small cap companies when they started out on that journey. Yep. Um, with one exception, Microsoft is, is, is one of those that was a pretty big company 30 years ago, even. But the other nine were, or the other, you know, top, if you look at top 10, the other nine were tiny companies. And so, we like some of those. Um, I would say, you know, to be specific, um, I industrial growth. So if there are industrial companies that have strong secular tailwinds, um, but are trading at industrial kind of boring multiples, we're finding a lot of exciting businesses there. Do you have any names that you could, examples of companies you're looking at? I don't have to say what you're buying, but just some companies in that sector, uh, regardless of whether or not you're actually yeah. putting them into portfolios. Yeah, I would say in the context of, of, um, I can tell you what we what we like, but more in the context of of strategies. So for those investors that are looking for long term growth um, at a reasonable price, um, we like a company like Timken. So Timken has actually been around for a long time. It was um, the the Timken family was the inventor of the uh, ball bearing. So you're saying, gosh, that's not, how can it be? It can it get any more bearing than a ball? boring than a ball bearing. Um, but 
in engineered uh, bearings are, are highly engineered nowadays, and they also are involved in all sorts of industrial motion. And as the as we grow, as the society grows and middle class grows among the emerging markets, mm -hmm. there are just more things that move. People move the rail and car; those require more uh, engineering engineer bearings and, and industrial motion. And some of these really attractive. Um, secular growth areas. So automated warehouses, um, reshoring, onshoring, all of those mm -hmm. things require, you know, um, sensors, guided vehicles, all sorts of things that have um, bearings in them and, and industrial motion. Um, I'll give you another one, robotics. So mm -hmm. um, Timken uh, gears, sensors, and engineer bearings are heavily used in not only industrial robotics. So you think about the floor of a Tesla factory, but also um, surgical robotics. So the, the intuitive surgical uses a lot of very small bearings. So this is a business that we like at the core. It's a, um, there's a lot of intellectual property. They are, these engineer bearings um, have to be, they, they get engineered into or designed into a, um, a, 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 a manufacture a business or an in industrial uh, part and it's hard to pull them out um they're recurring revenues the bearings wear down so there's a nice strong recurring revenue component of this business trades at a very attractive multiple particularly by the way when you take give it credit for timken india which is growing like a weed that they own a majority of so we like the long-term uh, uh attractiveness of this business it's kind of one of those that you say, gosh, that's boring. And yet you start to realize how quickly they can grow uh, their business over the very long term. And it, and you'll get as excited about it as I am. You know, I, boring is sexy to me. I mean, I ran a dividend newsletter service for, for, for 10 years and picked, you know, coffin companies, sewage company. Nobody, nobody stops flushing right. their toilet in a recession, right? So like all those gritty, boring things that make the world go around. I mean, and, and they're, they're good and that they don't tend to get as speculative. You know, you don't tend to have the hype around those as you do around NVIDIA. And it sounds like from your earlier comments, right. I was going to ask you about that because we're required by law to talk about NVIDIA, right? These days is, is everything. But it sounds like you're not that jazzed. I mean, it's obviously a very expensive stock and you'd rather put your money in, in a bearings company these days. So uh, it, it's not an either or for me. It is a both. Um, we own NVIDIA on the behalf of clients. Um, we're underweighted relative to the, the market. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I'd say just real quickly. I, NVIDIA is an incredible business. Um, as soon as I appreciated that there is a important software component to what they do and it wasn't just hardware, um, I got more excited about it. But I would just say just in general um, about AI in general. So we, we like artificial intelligence and um, we think that it will, be pro it will be positive for the overall economy. And for and productivity for those companies that embrace AI will go up. Um, and so just 10 sec, I, I, it won't be 10 seconds, James, you know, I go too long, but <laughs> um, briefly on that, we think there's four ways to play AI. First is it's the, the, those companies that are building those base foundational large language models, mm -hmm. um, the generative mm -hmm. AI models like, like Microsoft, like Alphabet, Google, that's the most obvious way to play it. There's going to be other ones, but those are the companies that have the big resources to, to build the best foundational models. Then there's the picks and shovels plays. So that's where NVIDIA fits yeah. in. Um, in order to invest, to be in an AI, it's a highly, highly compute intensive um, task. And so you need those GPU chips that that AI that NVIDIA is providing. So they're going to be great for a while. There's other ones that we found, believe it or not, HVAC companies that are focused on data centers mm -hmm. and these, these compute build outs have been a, a fantastic um, uh, um, pro, uh, providers of, of great investment returns and will continue to be. Um, the next piece though is your data is important. So you need to be able to protect, mm -hmm. monitor, uh, organize and protect that data. So there's some cybersecurity and uh, security adjacent companies, companies that help you understand and aggregate your data. Those things are really valuable. The final piece is if, you know, it's not just going to be how great your model is, 
Um, it's also going to be how great your data is. So those companies that have proprietary data and are embracing how to use that data in a new AI world will be super valuable. So excited about many of those as well. Um, and, you know, they're the most, you know, there's super obvious ones and then there's super, uh, there's ones that you'll have to find out about if you become a Sam client. <laughs> it's tempting. It's very tempting, Austin. And you, Austin, you're a wealth of information. I feel we could do an AI episode just on that. Uh, very tempting. I, I hope we can we can speak in in the future. I know you're a busy guy, so I want to be respectful of your time, but, but it's been very, very uh, enlightening to chat with you now. So if someone is watching this saying, yes, you know, I want, I want more of Austin Root. I want to learn more. Uh, where would you send that person? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, James. Um, so Stansberry A.M. Dot com stands b e s t a n s b e r r y a m for asset management dot com. Um, there's a on the top right. There's a get started button. You can click on that. You can schedule a time to talk with one of us, or just to get more information. Um, we've got lots of details and white papers and things that we're thinking about on the website. So I encourage you, you know, just to peruse that and 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 learn learn a little more about us. Excellent. It sounds like you can talk to a real person too, which is, which is especially yeah. cool these days. So stansburym.com, we'll put a link on, on the screen or on, on the show notes below. Uh, Austin, you've been very generous. Thank you so much. And as always, thanks to you guys for watching us at home.